How are you this morning? Uh, I'm always better in the morning. <laughs> on the home stretch. <laughs> Better this morning. That's good. I That's know, because I rested last night, so yeah. <laughs> a little better. Good session. That was a good session. Thank I am Terry Klein. Hello, I'm Christina, colleague from Shire. Oh. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you, yeah. too. This is a good session. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh. I guess you will, you will take some rest after the conference, right? Oh, I want to. Yeah. Too. We have a walk run tomorrow. Oh, no, I wanted, I wanted to. Hi, not. Michelle. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Me. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I can't believe this is the first time I've. Oops, I'm sorry, dear. I know. That Thank I've actually good. said hello to you. The I know. Time. So, how are you feeling? Good. I mean, good. I mean, I feel a little better this morning with my leg. It's just been a challenge, you know. It's yeah. Just are you in pain? Real bad yesterday. Oh. Real bad last night. About one or two, I think I knocked it out and started to fall asleep. But it's just um, it's better in the morning. I'm just trying to do what the doctor told me to do and try not to wait there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna. They're setting a chair up. I'm gonna moderate from there, just so I don't have to get up and down the stage. Yeah. Hello. Hi, I'm Terry. Hi, Peter. It's nice to meet you. Good morning. I didn't get to say Stephen hi to Stephen. I wanted to say hi to Stephen. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited to Happy to be here. Oh, so I, I reinforce what you want to, to, to understand why we're, why, why we're doing this. Why you're doing this. Why are you in the space? Sure. You know, what, what is Regenix Files philosophy? Why did you choose where to do this? You know, what is that like? Perfect. So, I think Vivian um, conveyed that well. Yeah. 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 It'll feel quick, you know, because it's 10 minutes each and, yeah. and open it up for a Q&A. <laughs> It'll kind of fly, you know. Yeah. Uh, they do have a timer screen up here, so you guys will have your own screen. Okay. Okay, so you'll see your clock and see your timer. Some of the things are just on Steven, I'm not going to moderate from the stage. Okay. Hi, Matthias. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Matthias, I'm right? I'm Matthias. I want to make sure I say it right. <laughs> so, I just wanted you guys to know I'm moderating. Michelle Berg with Aviona. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yep, I think we met last year at the National MTS Society. Yeah. Hi, Steven, you. Pleasure to meet you. So you'll be up on this, you guys will be up on the stage, on the panel, but I'm going to moderate from the chair down here so I don't have to have the steps, which is a little unusual, but I don't want to be stumbling around. Oh, there it is. Okay? <laughs> Nobody wants that. Fantastic. Nobody wants that. It wasn't, I know, I heard it last second. That's crazy. Like, I feel like, should we go over and you can sit? <laughs> I know, we can just have a coffee chat. So, Matthias, I'm going to be moderating from the chair down here. Yes, Absolutely. please. Okay. Do you want us to sit upstairs yes. there? Yeah. Okay. yeah. You guys each have a mic that's live and sound good. Who's, who's starting? Um, we are I starting with Michelle. 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 Yeah. Michelle starting first. Yeah. 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 And then your second, your third, and I'll introduce each of you. Okay. We're good? All right. We're good to go. Okay. I've heard that. Well, you're going to introduce me. I'm going to introduce you. I am. But you're welcome to go up on the stage. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Good morning. If we could all settle in, that would be that would be lovely. Good morning. I know some of you might not be able to see me, but I'm moderating from the chair down here, and I'm excited to introduce our next session. 
it is importance of research and advocacy group collaboration, emerging therapies and frontier science, and we have for you a panel of industry, entrepreneurship, and industry development in rare diseases. I want to first introduce Michelle Berg. Michelle joined the company of Abiona in June of 2015, serving initially as the Vice President of Patient Advocacy and transitioning in late 2017 to Vice President, uh, Vice President of Patient Affairs and Community Engagement to better reflect the developmental focus. Her experience spans over 20 years in the gene and cell therapy, vaccine gene editing, and molecular diagnostic fields. Thanks, Terry. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm excited to kick off the family sessions today. Um, as Terry said, my name is Michelle Berg, Vice President of Patient Affairs and Community Engagement with Abiona Therapeutics. And um, I'm very honored to be here and want to thank the planning committee for inviting me to share a little bit more about how our company got started. It's something I truly enjoy sharing about. It's quite unique. So like every public company, we have to have the forward-looking statements. And I thought I'd start with a question I'm often asked is, how do we pronounce Abiona Therapeutics? And I always break it down very simply, A-B-O-N-A, Abiona. I love to share about the origin for the name of the company because it is named after the Roman goddess. That's said to be the protector of children as they start out on their journey. And as you'll hear, uh, the focus that we have on uh, pediatric rare diseases, that's a very appropriate name and something that falls well within our mission. So as you probably have heard from other sessions and other speakers previously, uh, Abiona is focused on investigating gene therapies in children that are affected by MPS3A and MPS3B with the goal of providing a functional SGSH or, S or NAGLU gene delivered by an AAV and uh, administered by a single intravenous infusion and hopefully for a long-term uh, expression. So that is what we're studying currently. Before I get into how we as an organization started, I feel that I must back up just a little bit to talk about how really the families started everything in all of this. Um, certainly the National MPS Society had existed uh, decades ago and provided excellent services, excellent education and support. Uh, but I know that there were families that felt there was a need to focus specifically on San Filippo syndrome. And one of the very first families to do so was the Wilson family, who, as you see right here, this little bright spot of sunshine, uh, Kirby Wilson, was diagnosed in 1995 uh, with San Filippo. And this was at a time when there wasn't Google, it wasn't the power of the internet, power connectivity that we know today. And so Brad, uh, Kirby's father, hit the uh, University of Chicago library and um, was paired up with a medical librarian and really dug in. And uh, the name that kept coming up, in addition to um, Dr. John Hopwood, was, uh, of course, Dr. Neufeld. And so they contacted her. Uh, she had been doing a, a significant research already in lysosomal storage diseases. And they asked her, what, what do we do? And she said, well, we need funding. We need help to advance the research. So they did just that. They funded a position that um, it was actually an individual that went from Dr. Neufeld's lab over to the University of Minnesota. And uh, that kind of got things started with regard to the research. And they also did eventually fund Dr. Joseph Munzer. They had heard that he had been working in the MPSs and, and wanted to do as, as much as they could to spread out the research funding. And that led to the gene therapy approach that came out of uh, Dr. Fu and Dr. McCarty's lab. And they eventually transitioned over to Nationwide Children's Hospital in 2003. And so that's a real quick overview of just how that sparked. And I feel it's an important thing to share because uh, we only just got the ball five years ago. It's been building, it's been passed, and it's been cultivated from families like the Wilsons um, since then. And so that does, again, lead me to our specific origin story, again, with the, the foundations the Cure Kirby Foundation, uh, in addition to that, we had foundations from Canada, Spain, as well as uh, here in the United States, Australia, Mexico, and um, Switzerland that came together and really allowed us to understand more about San Filippo. They provided, uh, interestingly, venture philanthropy or funding to help us lift this further off the ground because the goal was to move from preclinical studies into the clinic. 
And so with that, we do refer to these groups as our founding foundations and are still very involved with, with all of them today. So as I said, we started in 2013, focused on MPS3A and MPS3B. In 2015, we had the opportunity to merge with a publicly traded entity, uh, Plasmatech Biopharmaceuticals, and came back and returned to the name Aviona Therapeutics as I shared why. And what is really interesting is that not only did these families spark and, and really progress the research, for San Filippo syndrome, but it's enabled us as a company to advance into other rare diseases beyond MPS3A and MPS3B. So the work that we did together was to prepare for our clinical trials, and that was um, with a natural history study. And again, that was in collaboration with not only Nationwide Children's Hospital, of course, but um, three of the foundations that were listed there. And that information has been published, and that was a uh, is certainly a, a priority for the foundations. And in May of 2016, we initiated our clinical study, our phase one, two, studying MPS3A. Uh, we have currently enrolling sites in Columbus, Ohio, as well as Adelaide, Australia, and Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And just late last year, we initiated our clinical study for MPS3B. And so as we look at uh, opportunities on how we can continue to build towards success. Something that was a learning point for us was the communication during transition and change. And what I mean by that is, as I shared, we started out as a very small private entity in preclinical study and working very closely with those dozen foundations. And as we transition from that private company into a public company, and as we transition from preclinical into clinical, it was very clear that the nature and the, the flow of communication had to be adjusted because our requirements placed on us were, were becoming different. And I think that there was an opportunity to manage that change better. And so we're taking that, we're taking that opportunity to learn from that and apply that to the future com communications and engagements. Something that we've really taken as a priority is to really seek the designations from the regulatory bodies to help enable us uh, for more uh, frequent communication, more meaningful communication, and um, certainly more specific communication so that we can keep very close with the FDA, for example, the EMA, for example, um, just to make sure that we are sharing with them, this is what we're intending to do. How do you feel about that? Or what do you think? Help guide us on that. And that's really important as we continue to move forward with our, our um, clinical studies because, of course, we have the goal of being successful. That's the goal that we started out with those 12 foundations. And as you may have seen in some recent news, we have brought in additional expertise. We have grown our team and we're very excited about that. Um, we've brought in uh, team members that have specifically, ex have specific rather, experience and expertise in getting things over that that goal line from clinical into commercial. And so we are working very closely with them as we prepare for what we, again, hope for success. And another significant piece, as you've probably heard from other speakers, when you're in gene therapy, um, manufacturing of the gene therapy product is absolutely critical and, and quite challenging. And so we've sought to control basically our own destiny. And what we've done is we have, um, we have built out our uh, commercial manufacturing facility. And so that's intended to have the capacity, that's intended to have the right quality structures, of course, that are necessary so that we can transition from a clinical manufacturing platform into commercial. And so I think I'll close with the things that I've learned uh, as I've been with the organization now for just over three years, and I'm the one who gets to interact with the foundations. I get to interact with the families and hear from everybody. And so I've learned a significant amount from all of you. And I think one of the most compelling pieces or things that I've learned is that you cannot underestimate the power of a parent. You cannot underestimate the power of an individual who has the desire to find a solution. And so with that, I'd like to close and just say thank you again for, for your attention. Thank you for your time. And certainly thank you for all of the support from the, research, from the community. Appreciate that. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Matthias Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt joined Armagen as the President and Chief Executive Officer, a member of Armagen's Board of Directors in October of 2016. Dr. Schmidt has spent 20 years of global biopharmaceutical industry experience and executive management focused on the research and development of biotherapeutics and pharmaceuticals. He received his Master's in Biotechnology from the University of Stuttgart and his PhD in tumor biology, Kumus Hamlad, from the University of Freiburg, Germany. After working for several years at the at various cancer hospitals in Germany and in the US. He joined the pharmaceutical industry in 1999 and we're so glad that he did. Prior to Armagen, he held various positions from Takeda Pharmaceuticals and its subsidiaries in 2001, including oncology and drug discovery, drug discovery partnerships and biologics. He joined Takeda California in 2012 as vice president of the biological sciences where he built a biotherapeutics unit serving all therapeutic indications and all research sites within the Global Takeda Organization. In 2011, he was awarded the Vena Legena in Pharmacology from the University of Constance, where he lectures on cellular biology, disease biology, pharmacology. Thank you so much, Terry, for the very kind introduction, and thank you for organizing a absolutely A-plus fantastic conference. It's a fantastic conference, there's so much attention to the detail, but very importantly, I also want to sincerely thank the parents, the patients, for such a warm-hearted welcome back. It's like joining a family when I, when I get to those conferences. Uh, I even saw some cars in the parking lot, one from, uh, actually from Washington, one from uh, Missouri, and those MPS labels, oh my gosh. They have gone a long way by car to come here, to come to this conference. And in the upper right corner, there's a family that promoted me last year to MPS Superhero, the title I'm most proud of and probably most undeserved as uh, many of my titles that I have. If you read this question, I wish my child had cancer. Did you ever wish your child had cancer? I, I see in this room at least one person who told this, she told this to me, I wish my child had cancer. If I asked this question at any conference, nobody would say yes, except at the MPS conferences. And she told me because, you know, if my daughter had cancer, there was, there was hope. And she said, hope is such a nasty word until we turn hope into action. And this is what we're talking here. We're talking about the importance of the interaction, the collaboration between research and advocacy groups and Terry also asked me to talk about New Frontiers, Frontier Science. So I, I want to go beyond. If we only turn hope into action, it's, it's worth nothing. We need to apply Frontier Science, Frontier Companies, and also Frontier Funding in order to develop Frontier Medicines. You as patient advocacy groups, as parents, you have, you have helped build an entire industry. And this is the number of FDA drug approvals from 1983 when the Orphan Drug Act was implemented until now. It created, you helped create an entire new uh, industry and you helped, helped create a better tomorrow um, for the patients that we try to serve. And how does this relate to Armagen? And in, in my position, I try to instill a few core beliefs that for me are absolutely non-negotiable. And number one is every human life counts the same. It doesn't matter how many stars we have on our shoulder. We all have 46 chromosomes. Some even have more. And non-negotiable number two is society has given me an education that allows me to do something that is not rocket science. It is harder. And I feel like I owe this back to society in the form of innovation that turns into new medications, a better tomorrow for the patients. And I try to instill this in Armagen. And the team, by doing what they do, they develop mastery. I try to give them autonomy, but this does not suffice until we instill a sense of purpose. And if we have a sense of purpose, then we can move mountains. And the sense of purpose comes from you. It's fundamentally important. So what are you giving to us? Again, number one, the sense of purpose. 
you are the driver of innovation. You don't accept the status quo and please keep pushing us. You keep pushing the boundaries and we need to do it to together. We learn so much from you about the disease. You can't, we can't learn it from a textbook. We need to interact with you to understand what keeps you up at night. You, need, you, you educate us about endpoints, you, you educate the FDA, what really matters here, and often you kick us out of the ivory tower. Sometimes it's hard, but thank you for, for, for doing this. And you give the disease a name and a face, so you are my superheroes. One example is the, uh, the Sarkar family, they came to visit us in Calabasas at the headquarters of Armagen um, like three weeks ago. And boy, I can tell you, we had a blast. Um, four heroes, so it's Carter and um, his, his mom and his dad and Sophia, um, his big sister. We had a blast together. So again, they were giving the disease a name and a face. It's so motivational for us that we know we try to create a better tomorrow for patients like, like Carter. How does this relate to Armagen? And I was also supposed to talk about New Frontier Science. So you all know what enzyme replacement therapy is and enzyme replacement therapy really has given a lot of hope and benefit to the patients. But as you all know, there is a beast, a beast in the room that is called the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier was very important in evolution to prevent noxious and infectious agents to cross the brain. But it's very difficult to get those very nasty enzymes, like this little thing here, across the blood-brain barrier. So those parent, patients always often suffer from a neurocognitive decline, behavioral abnormalities, everything that we heard during the last three days. So Armagen is, has embarked on a technology to bring large molecules across the blood-brain barrier. You all know from, um, from high school that insulin is only made in the pancreas. And there is an important role for insulin in the brain. So what Armagen has done, and, and insulin is, a, is shuttled across the blood-brain barrier by a receptor called the insulin receptor. So Armagen has made an antibody against the insulin receptor. And we need to have this enzyme. And the antibody alone, by binding to this receptor, can actually shuttle into the brain. And by linking the enzyme to the antibody, we have a shuttle that can bring the antibody into the brain, but also in the somatic cells. I owe this antibody to Erika Thiel. If she's in the room, please feel free to come up and pick it up. So does it work? This is studies in monkeys, where we had the uh, naked enzyme on the left. We labeled them with radioactivity and the antibody fusion on the right. We gave it to the monkeys. And you see the, the brain of the aldorazyme treated monkeys. It's white because it doesn't go into the brain. But the fusion molecule does go across the blood-brain barrier into the brain and into similar organs of the body in, in those monkeys. Where are we with this program? Um, we, are, we have completed a phase two study where we wanted to see whether in contrast to standard ERT, does our fusion protein actually stabilize the neurocognitive um, disease burden, the neuro neurocognitive decline, and does it also take control of the somatic disease as well? So what we did is we went into Brazil, into a very severely affected patient population, severe MPS1, and those kids in, the, in Brazil, because donor screening is not in place, they, um, they don't have access to stem cell transplantation. So those kids, many of them were, almost all of them were on Lerone days before. We switched them from one week to another to this molecule called HET181. And we followed them up for, for one year and we looked for neurocognitive endpoints and we looked for somatic endpoints. And as I said, and some of those who have uh, listened to Elsa Shapiro, this is the natural history of those kids. If they're not transplanted, they, they lose a lot of DQ, it's about between 10 and 20 DQ points per year um, if they're not transplanted. So how, does, how did this compare to our study? So Krivit, at the beginning, at the end of the last millennium, he um, revealed a DQ change of uh, around about minus 20 DQ points per year. Elsa Shapira, uh, Shapira did a reanalysis and I just talked to her. She said minus 10 point is about fair. What we have seen in our patient population in 11 patients 
minus 1.1, minus 1.2, which is basically a complete stabilization of the patients. We had some severe attenuated patients. They were, you would call them maybe Herlache, but they had a DQ of 30, so they're very severely affected. And we even saw a uh, an increase in the development quotient of in, in those kids. And if you look at every single patient, every bar here is a single patient, and you can see those 11 patients, and even a layman here in the room would say, we have two patients that probably didn't really respond, but nine out of this, those 11 patients either stabilized or improved in the, in the cognitive, uh, in the cognitive uh, development quotient, and we feel very humble about those data. So we have, depending on whether we take Shapiro or Krivit as a reference, we have a response rate between 80 and 90%. A comparable study in MPS3, Shire, did the IT trial. Um, they, have, they have revealed a responder rate uh, of around about 14%. Of course, you cannot compare apples with oranges. It's a different disease. But still, we believe that um, our, our data are pretty meaningful. Surprisingly, we also saw a uh, decrease in the uh, liver and spleen volume up to 50%, despite the fact that those kids were heavily pretreated with enzyme replacement therapy. Um, Laronidase. So this, this platform is applicable to multiple diseases because the enzyme is almost interchangeable. And we have a portfolio um, of molecules, two in the clinic and preclinical and six preclinical programs that we are uh, that we're working on. I just want to quickly share one experiment in MPS3A, where we had the MPS3A mouse and we looked, this is basically the green bars, uh, the reduction of the substrates on the left side in the brain and on the right side in the somatic tissue. It also in animal wor uh, models works, works very well in, in MPS3A. And just one quick story how um, representatives from Team San Filippo in this case really helped us to move an FDA mountain. They were, they contacted us about 15 months ago or 18 months ago, um, seeing how our prog program was faring and they wanted to challenge the FDA about the development path because they were hammering us with some safety requirements. We met with the FDA and the outcome of this FDA meeting is that the FDA gave us a path forward that is very, very lean. They told us, go immediately into pediatric patients. Don't go into adults. Go with a dose where you think it's already therapeutically meaningful and a benefit. Dose them up, follow a biomarker. If you don't, follow bio, don't have a biomarker, follow the safety. Keep them on the drug for as long as you think it takes to measure an endpoint and we will grant you approval. This would not have happened without the support of those um, foundations. So I, I just want to stop here saying, partnering with patient advocacy groups, it does move mountains. And it's not partnering in the impossible. It might look, moving mountains looks impossible, but together it is possible. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Yu from Regenix Bio. Dr. Yu is the Chief Medical Officer at Regenix Bio. Prior to joining Regenix Bio, Dr. Yu was Medical Science Director of the Clinical Development at AstraZeneca and Group Director of the Clinical Development at Metamune, as a, a, AstraZeneca's Global Biologics Research and Development Arm. In those roles, he led the late phase clinical project teams while providing strategic and operational leadership to physician scientists. In previous roles at Metamune, he provided strategic clinical leadership for early phase programs. Early in his career, Dr. Yu served as the Associate Director of Clinical Development at Abbott Laboratories. Dr. Yu holds an MD from the University of California, Los Angeles School of Medicine and a BA in Molecular and Cell Biology from the University of California, Berkeley. So thank you so much for uh, the invitation and being here. I think, you know, really excited to share with all of you in the room about Regenix Bio and what we're doing in gene therapy, uh, specifically with the MPS um, in the world of lysosomal storage diseases. So just um, as a publicly traded company, we have a forward-looking statement that we're required to show. 
So you know, I, I think the, the title here around Regenix Bio really um, encapsulates what we're trying to do as a company, which is to seek to improve lives through the curative potential of gene therapy. And um, some of you may be familiar with Regenix, uh, some of you may not, and I wanted to take an opportunity to introduce Regenix as a company to those in the room. Um, you know, we, we are a gene therapy company, and we have based our company based on our platform of adeno-associated viral vectors, or AAVs, uh, that were discovered at the University of Pennsylvania. And you know, what we've really been encouraged you know, as a company is seeing how broadly and um, th that this technology has been used across multiple therapeutic areas. And as a company, we've embraced that, and we have um, programs uh, in the eye as well as uh, in the metabolic space. But more specifically, we have programs here looking at lysosomal storage diseases. And I'm going to get into a little bit where we're focusing um, but we're really focusing on the neurocognitive aspects of, of, of the lysosomal storage diseases. Um, you know, as a company, we're really, try really trying to enable the field of gene therapy because we do uh, have a strong portfolio of these different vectors and a lot of different vectors, and we've been able to partner with a lot of other companies in terms of using the technology, and, and happy to say that there's been a lot of success in some of these programs in terms of some of those clinical outcomes. Um, and, and so I think, you know, from a perspective of where we are as a company, we really look at gene therapy as a, or lysosomal storage diseases as a way to really, um, you know, change the way that we practice medicine and think about how uh, gene therapy can be applied. So more specifically, in terms of mucopolysaccharidosis 1 and 2 or MPS 1 and 2, I don't need to tell anybody in the room on the, on the left side of this slide. But uh, you know, what we're really doing here is we're taking one of our vectors, AAV9, which has been shown through animal studies and through you know, even clinical studies to have a propensity of, of, of really being able to, to transduce neurons in the brain and look at neurological tissues. And I think when we looked at um, across the spectrum of different um, places to go with gene therapy, and specifically in MPS1 and 2, we really wanted to be in an area where we thought there was the highest unmet need. And we know that in, uh, in many of these lysosomal storage diseases, they are multisystemic and there's lots of different symptoms and lots of different um, things that could be treated. But when we looked across a spectrum, we felt like the greatest unmet need here is really in the brain in terms of trying to halt the neurocognitive decline that occurs in the severe aspects or severe forms of the disease. And so, you know, we had a vector, we have a vector AAV9, which has been used in, in multiple um, different clinical trials and indications, including, you know, some of the speakers today in, in companies like, like Abiona, as well as other diseases such as spinal muscular atrophy or even organ. And, you know, we thought, you know, this is a really great opportunity to use um, a technology that really targets a specific, uh, has a propensity to target a specific um, organ or has a high propensity for that. And, and, you know, lining up with where we thought the biggest unmet need was for, for these particular diseases. And in particular, you know, the previous speaker, Matthias, has talked about the issue of the blood-brain barrier. And so, you know, our perspective was you know, how, how can, we've done a lot of animal studies and a lot of uh, studies looking at, you know, what's the best way really to get the most amount of, of AAV to the area where, where we feel like it's needed the most. And that was really looking at different delivery options. And as we looked across the spectrum of, you know, um, different ways to administer the vector, we, we landed on, you know, trying to get this vector really into the CSF to have as much direct access to the brain to be able to try to increase the amount of, of, of enzyme that gets produced to try to um, address the unmet need here in terms of um, not being able to produce enzyme, enough enzyme and in, in causing neurocognitive decline. And so we've taken an approach, which is a unique approach, which um, you know, Jake Wesley from our, our company will be presenting on later, in terms of an intracisternal approach. And this is an approach that's been used actually clinically a long time ago and uh, that we've brought back in. And it's um, from animal models. We feel like it gives us the best opportunity to really have the broadest distribution of vector to the most amount of cells or neurons in the brain while trying to maintain um, the best safety profile from our animal studies. Um, you know, like others here, we, we've engaged with regulators in terms of getting special regulatory status, and, and I think what this just means is that, you know, we're partnering with the regulatory agencies to try to develop this as quickly as possible because we know that there's an unmet need out there. Um, so, so we do have two active um, uh, INDs open that are um, for MPS1 and for MPS2, 
And so just to review here, we do have an active phase one clinical trial that's currently recruiting at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and for this particular trial, uh, for both of them, you know, the primary safety, primary outcomes are gonna be safety and tolerability. These are first in human trials in terms of evaluating AAV9 with either IDUA or IDS being expressed um, uh, in the brain. And so, you know, when we look at this and we've partnered with the regulators, um, for this particular indication, the first subject will have to be an adult subject, uh, which would be a, a hurler shea subject who has some kind of documented evidence of some kind of neurocognitive decline. And, you know, gene therapy is one of those aspects, even in an early stage study when we're looking at safety and tolerability, you know, it's really a, a one shot on goal here in terms of the ability to produce, to, to administer and, and try to get a therapeutic effect. And the regulators know that and we know that. And so what we're trying to do is uh, figure out doses that can really um, be, have the best chance to be efficacious in terms of our preclinical data, but also we need to be able to go in a stepwise fashion to assess safety and tolerability. Um, so as with any kind of phase one study, we expect dosing to be in a dose escalation um, format. So we start with a lower dose and go to a higher dose. Um, you know, those um, people who enroll in the trial will have to be enrolled in sequential fashion. And so we'll have to dose a patient and have to look at uh, safety evaluation and then dose the subsequent patient uh, and then and move on from there. The primary endpoint here will be at 24 weeks to look at safety, but we're going to be looking, um, following these uh, people for a long time in terms of um, two years in the study and then even expecting long-term follow-up after that. For uh, MPS2, we have a phase one, two clinical trial. Uh, and, and really, it's, uh, again, safety and tolerability, but given that in MPS2, th there's a little bit more of a, a demar demarcation in that, you know, when we see neurocognitive effects, you know, we really only see them in the pediatric population, and we don't really see it um, in the adult population. So with partnering with the FDA, you know, again, there has to be some kind of direct benefit, potential for benefit in conducting these types of clinical trials. And so, you know, we've really focused on looking at younger subjects where we can um, you know, have a potential for benefit and intervention in terms of stabilizing um, the neurocognitive decline that could occur in these, in these patients. And so this trial is currently open and recruiting at the University of Pittsburgh um, as of now. And again, it's a similar format in terms of our, um, in our clinical trial where we're looking at um, a, in a dose escalation, two doses, uh, in sequential fashion, um, patient by patient, and looking at safety and tolerability for each subject before we advance, and then looking at safety um, between doses before we go to the next dose with a very similar format. So, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, the objective for me here was really to introduce everybody to Regenix, to the idea of gene therapy, um, that we're committed as a company to applying gene therapy uh, to lysosomal storage diseases, in particular, we're starting with MPS1 and 2. And hopefully you understand kind of our philosophy in, in looking at uh, applying the technology to where we think the greatest unmet need is. But, you know, that, that's really kind of a first step in terms of thinking about gene therapy for these particular diseases. And, uh, you know, we've been able to partner with a lot of you in the room. I look forward to partnering with more of you in the room and look forward to, you know, as we start to enroll the clinical studies, you know, to better understand how gene therapy could potentially help you know, patients with these diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yu. You know, when we first started to form this session, we wanted to be able to provide a format that, that introduced our, our families um, to entrepreneur companies. You know, it was not more than five years ago that we had three or four or five companies in the space that were in for mucopolysaccharides and for the oligosaccharides. And, and the landscape has changed, and it's evolved, and research is evolving. And because of that, patient advocacy groups like the MPS or, or like our sister foundations throughout the country and throughout the world have had more of an opportunity to engage with these companies that are coming forward and developing science. It's our opportunity if someone has a question to ask, but I think I'll lead it off myself for everyone. Um, but we thought we'd try to do a, a quick little Q&A if you have any questions for the panelists. Um, and I thought I would ask the question about, you know, communication is moving so fast. It's moving so quickly. How, 
how do you manage communication with, with patient advocacy groups to help them understand what your science is and in that science, there still has to be tests that are done, uh, baselines that have to be done, animal testing done. How do they understand and how do you communicate clinical trial timelines to families when things feel like they're at a rapid speed in this ecosystem we're in in the 21st century? Go ahead and start. Um, so I think that to answer that, you know, we really try to communicate often in, in the sense that um, it is a, a message that continually needs to be repeated. Those are very, um, in many cases, challenging topics to grasp while you're in the midst of, of, of really um, either receiving, having just received a diagnosis or moving through the progression of a, of a particular disease. And so what we find is that it's really important to um, try to convey in multiple, I guess, platforms and formats because people learn and absorb information differently. But as I said, um, to repeat that message because there are continuously, unfortunately, more and more individuals or families that are coming into this that are, again, quite new. And so that's one thing. Um, the other thing I'd say, too, is that, um, you know, as I mentioned, we work with a dozen foundations. Uh, we try to seek to find out how they best feel about communication or wish to have communication. Um, some are, are just happy to receive, um, you know, email updates as we send out, and then they distribute out to the, the families that they serve, uh, and some we have standing calls with. But it really is tailored to each individual foundation and what they, they need. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I feel like I've never been a situa in a situation where I was accused of um, having communicated too much. I, th I feel like I was always in the situation of having communicated too little. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I believe that the, uh, the advocacy groups are the much better communicators than we are. And uh, I want to really encourage advocacy groups, patients, ambassadors to reach out to us. I, I am always excited when I get contacted by, when I get an email by par from parents, from patients, this community is so small that I, um, I think in hopefully 100% of the cases, I responded myself and got into contact um, with, with the author of an email or whoever contacted me. Sometimes this uh, results into a, in, a, in a big snowball where a snowflake falls down and things get rolling. And sometimes we have to, we have to convey the message but that, uh, sorry, but this is not a field that we are currently working in and that we currently don't have resources for, especially when, uh, when people approach us with, uh, with a pathology that is very similar to lysosomal storage diseases, but not exactly where the technology, where the platform is, is applicable. And I feel like I would give the, uh, a wrong promise, and I would hate myself for, for giving a wrong promise or false promise, a promise I, I cannot deliver uh, to those people by by not telling them the, uh, the truth. I feel like interacting here at those conferences, I, I have met so many ambassadors and they spread the word. And Web 2.0 is probably the platform how to communicate. I'm not, the, I'm not a Facebook or Twitter person, but there's people who can help us here. And the, the, spread word, the word spreads, is spreading so incredibly quickly. And just one example, the. Uh, the Saving Carter, um, the family, the Sarka family, within four weeks, I think they raised something like a million dollars. And nowadays you can do it only via, you know, spreading the word through Facebook to all, through all those channels, Web 2.0 channels um, that we have. But the, uh, I think the, to cut it all short, the, uh, the communication channels that we have Facebook, Web, Web 2.0, and those conferences. Our community, uh, community is small enough um, to stay connected. And please keep this network up. So, so I, I would say that, um, at least my experience with the MPS community is that it's, it's one of the most tight-knit communities that I've seen in terms of 
supporting one another and, and communicating with one another and whether it's through Facebook or it's through email chains or through you know meetings like this and I think you know that's a testament to the people in the room and to the to the advocacy groups and how strong each one of you advocate for uh, for MPS I think you know for us it's a philosophy of open communication and um, you know whether it's directly through our website or many of you may know Vivian who, who works at Regenix and developing relationships and, and I think the philosophy for us is this is an, is an ongoing conversation and, and and sometimes I think you know it it takes the tenor of well we have a question do you have the answer but I look at it more of as a two-way street as we're continuing to learn from everyone in the room as well and, and by no means you know do we think that we've implemented anything from a, a perfect approach and, and we're continuously trying to improve it whether it's you know, how we communicate about a clinical trial or how we think about what really matters to patients and so you know, I think, f at least from a communication perspective, that, that, that would be kind of a philosophy that I would um, engender, and I think that we have. Um, you know, I, but I think it's a challenge, because especially, as you mentioned, Terry, there's, you know, many, few years ago, there wasn't as, as much um, investment in terms of, of the MPS world and trying to develop new therapeutics, and when you have a lot of investment and you have a lot of activity, there's a lot of information that continuously changes, and, and there's, um, you know, it can create a swirl. And I, so I think you know it's um, the way to really try to address that is, is continual open communication and continual approach of wanting to learn from one another and trying to you know improve the process as we go along. Uh, but I think in the end that's a good thing when we have a lot more investment you know in the field trying to develop therapeutics across the board for you know patients who really need it. Thank you. Do we have any other questions at all from the audience, please? First of all, uh, thank you uh, for everything you did for this community. Uh, I'm a mom of uh, two MPS2 uh, patients, and I'm also a scientist in biotech industry. So I see both sides uh, in terms of the clinical development of the program and in terms of family uh, with the patient. Um, so I have some comments. Uh, first of all, um, you, as you all know that this is a rare, ultra rare disease field. And enrollment is gonna be very challenging. I'm sure Amogen already experienced some enrollment challenge there, right? So what, like, uh, we, I'm uh, closely following the uh, Regenix bio gene therapy for my son, but my son, one is 10 and a half, the other is eight. So enrollment is challenging, it takes time. We are now enrolled in the Shire clinical trial. It takes four years for my son, the younger son, to get into the trial because of a lot of uh, realistic uh, challenges. When they design the trial, it's a combination of its device and also the drug. So the device has problem and delayed the whole process. Uh, I wanna say is, um, so oh, when, when you design the clinical trial, maybe you should also think of a backup plan. Think from the patient side that we cannot wait if we can uh, do something in parallel, like, like uh, lumbar puncture, while waiting for the device, my, my, my son won't need to wait for four years, right? So, uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is um, when we do uh, the patient enrollment, uh, uh, I think we do a developmental score. But keep in mind, those kids, it's very challenging to really score those, those, those boys, those patients, because of all the behavior challenges. How do you define a patient has 55 and 77? It's really challenging. And my son, again, waited another two years to get the score from 90 to 85 to get into the trial. And while my older son is already a severe disease, we know he is in that uh, diagnosed, like, you know, so in that progression. So you should all take those into consideration. <coughs> um, I know, but from the other side, the scientists, FDA, everything, it's, that's why the advocacy uh, group is helping there to make the case. Um, so um, the, uh, the other thing is uh, compassionate use. As a biology, uh, we should be humble that we only know this much about biology. <laughs> We don't know a lot of things. So we, when we define the enrollment criteria, 
we based on our current knowledge. But as you probably also experienced, myself also experienced, a lot of medical miracle happens in compassionate use. So compassionate use is not only for patients, but also for science. For the science that, the, the part that we don't really quite understand. But we take the gut, we take the risk, we try it, and then we, we, we probably got some success. Um, like my son, eight years old, he is still very functional, comparing to the 10 and a half, because he got the treatment earlier. So age of five, I know it's a developmental milestone, but still, again, think about the whole picture. So that's my comment, sorry, it's very long. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, one specific question is to uh, uh, Regenix Bell um, the, uh, about the dosage for the gene therapy. I understand AAV is extra chromosome integration. So why do we still care about the dose? Uh, what's the uh, potential toxicity associated with the dose, low dose and high dose? So, so AAVs actually don't integrate into the chromosome, just to, to correct for yes. that, I think, uh -huh. so. Extra. Uh, yeah, so, you know, yeah. for those of you that, um, you know, in, in terms of the, the mechanism of the adeno-associated viruses, there are different types of gene therapies, and there are gene therapies that can actually um, mix into your existing DNA, like in the chromosomes, and then AV does not. Um, so I, I think you know there's you know w there's there's um, different th there's what we know and there's what we don't know in, in terms and this is a first in human study at least for you know for Regenix Bio and I so I think that you know we can do studies in animals and look at potential uh, effects in animals and we can actually even look at the clinical experience and I would say. You know, the, the, the clinical experience to date with AEV9 has been, you know, predominantly around uh, potential immune reactions to either a component of the, of the virus or to the actual protein that's being produced. Um, I think that, you know, the reason why, you know, I, I take your comments completely um, to heart that, you know, there's, you know, what I hear there is there is a need for speed in development, that we have to, you know, the unmet need um, is not getting any less, it's getting greater and that, you know, we have to be able to try to find ways to try to accelerate the development and, and evaluation of promising therapies like gene therapy. And, and I think, you know, we hear that call and that's something that, you know, we preach every day in terms of how we think about these things. We also have to balance, as you've, as you've indicated, in terms of, you know, our um, requirements from, from not just from regulators, but from the science itself. And as, as much as we want to go as quickly as we can, we want to make sure that we're approaching this in a way that protects the safety and, and uh, of, of, of the potential patients or subjects who are, who are being dosed. So, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the, the safety profile, uh, you know, th that's the entire purpose of the initial, initial study is to understand that. You know, in terms of the different doses, you know, as I've mentioned in the talk, w at least with gene therapy, we really start with doses that we think from our animal studies that we look at. So in this in case of MPS2, we've looked at uh, mice uh, that have MPS2, and we try to extrapolate from animals to what we think would be an effective dose in humans, and we start with that. But any kind of evaluation of any kind of investigational drug is gonna have to evaluate multiple doses to look at where we think the maximum benefit and the risk is. And you know, as much as more might sound better, more might come with increased risk as well. And I think, you know, we owe it in terms of trying to find a product in the end that will be able to be the optimal product for, for everybody to try to define that best benefit risk ratio uh, in, in patients. Thank you. Yeah. So, Jeremy, will you allow me another comment? So, <laughs> does the microphone work? <laughs> I think, okay, now it works. Thank you so much for this comment. and. I think you're so absolutely right with, with everything that you said. You have to remember time, time is life. Yeah. And that's what, what matters here. And even in my position, it very often drives me nuts and crazy that things are taking so much time. And yes, we are not doing a go good job here. You talked about enrollment of patients. What are our criteria? 
there's a certain balance between, you know, everybody knows the earlier you treat, the better the, the, the effect, but is this, is this an argument to bail out, not to treat the ones who really need it and who might benefit? Um, we were interacting with a, a patient syndicate, which I cannot disclose right now, but um, they were pushing us very hard back on, uh, on a first clinical protocol, and I think they rightly did so, because it was, uh, you know, I, I almost feel ashamed that we have communicated this to them, because we, we forgot also about those ones who, you know, where we may not see the biggest benefit, but those patients from whom we can learn a lot. Um, and I think that there's also some, some larger pharma representatives here you know, consider enrolling those patients in those trials. You may not enroll them for the final endpoint, but keep them on in an observation in order to learn from any kind of signs and symptoms that you see. Uh, it will direct your next uh, label extension trial. So you can, you can learn a lot from this. I, I wish we could instill more this every minute counts mentality. Um, when it comes to compassionate use, I... Um, it's, well, we, we have been working with some companies where, where we have partnered and we have been trying to push them to give access to those patients who have been on the drug and want to get back on the drug. And I personally feel that we, we are totally indebted to those patients. For 181, we offered compassionate use to all the patients when the, wherever the parents wanted. And we have now, I think, six or seven patients who continued on compassionate use. They felt like they, are, they benefit. And in Brazil, it's a different logistical challenge. But I think we really owe this um, to the patients. And one encouragement, um, what I would encourage you to do is, many, many companies use this slogan, we put the patients first, um, as a slogan to advertise. And pressure test the slogan. And go there and contact them and tell them, no, you're talking about putting the patient first, but your deeds don't speak for that. I want to measure you by your deeds and not by your words. And push back and send a letter, dear CEO, your company sucks. <laughs> Hi, we, we can take one more question, um, but, but we are running a little behind. Hi there, um, I'm a mother of a son who has MPS2 and who's currently enrolled in the intrathecal trial. And again, I had a similar question to this lady right here in terms of how you're evaluating improvement in neurocognition. I noticed that you mentioned that was a secondary endpoint. So as a mother who has watched my son undergo DOS testing <laughs> and who has also seen the behavioral challenges with having a six-year-old with Hunter syndrome sit for an almost hour and a half test, I'm very curious as to what steps you're taking to accurately identify an improvement in cognition. So I assume that, that question was directed. Well, I, I think in, in general, I think you know, when, I, when we talk about neurocognitive outcomes and especially in MPS2, as you've mentioned, in terms of challenges around behavior, that, that's definitely um, um, a challenge that exists, uh, I think, irrespective of kind of behavior, just with neurocognitive outcomes in general, because there are so many different factors that can impact how a child performs on that particular test. I think, you know, one of the best ways to try to address that is, is to talk to the parent yourself and to understand what are the best conditions under which your particular child is actually able to conduct and, and, and do those tests, because not every child is the same. I think, you know, trying to build in some flexibility into the testing procedure uh, to try to um, accommodate for different children and how they approach their their testing. You know, one child might want to you know, uh, and perform best in terms of having you know multiple tests in the same day. Another one might you know perform at their best uh, in terms of you know, having tests over multiple days. But I think you know the other thing too is not to rely solely just on the neurocognitive tests. We always speak about something we call a body of evidence, and so I think. You know, because there is you know, some, um, some difficulties in terms of the administration and sometimes in terms of the output, you know, at least our approach is to look at the totality. So we look at things like patient reported outcomes, things like biomarkers, uh, and when we're looking for signs of effect. And so 
Uh, it, it's not just relying on one particular test. And I think, and that's actually quite honestly where I think folks in this room can really be helpful too, is for you as parents, what are the outcomes that really matter to you the most? And that's where I think, you know, as industry and patients, we can partner with and need to partner to communicate to FDA, for example, that FDA may think neurocognition may be the most important thing, but it may be actually behavior. It may be something else. For my child, this might matter more than another outcome. Um, so, you know, I think there are some inherent challenges with that. I think there's, you know, communication, open communication with, with parents in terms of testing. And then I think we need to be able to look at beyond just the test and look at other types of outcomes and to be able to tell the story rather than just relying on one particular, one particular test. Sure, and I understand there has to be an objective measure, but I guess what I'm asking is specifically in your trial design, when you're looking at your neurocognitive tests, what kind of flexibility do you have in that trial design currently? So um, we'll have to, I'll have to double check with, with our team and th that's implementing that right now. So I think we're working with the site right now to figure out where we can provide the greatest flexibility in terms of listening to the parents and listening to the patients and figuring out what's the best way to, to administer that. So uh, I can follow up with you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. So our, our next presenter will be Lauren Clark. Lauren Clark is a professor of medical genetics at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, and a clinical and biochemical geneticist in the Provincial Medical Genetics Program for the province of the British Columbia. He is currently the medical director of the program and the head of the genetics and health research cluster at the Child and Family Health Research Institute at UBC. He received his initial training in biochemistry and medicine at the McGill University, Montreal, Canada, and is a certified in pediatrics, clinical genetics, and biochemical genetics. Professor Clark's major research interest is in the field of lysosomal storage disorders. He has been active in the fundamental research for over 25 years, studying the basic pathopsychology, physiology of LSDs, and particular interest in biomarkers of disease and immune models, and marine models. His group was the first to develop a mouse model of mucopolysaccharidosis one, and has recently produced mouse models of the Gaucher disease and gangliosis. In addition to the basic science, Professor Clark's group also actively participates in the clinical trials in registries involving LSDs and other rare genetic disorders. Professor Clark is also closely aligned with the various NPS societies where he serves as the chair of the Medical Advisory Board of the Canadian NPS Society and Related Diseases Society and sits on the board of the National NPS Society. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, when Terry and I were talking about this meeting uh, months and months ago, um, uh, I was asked to, uh, to provide a perspective of the complexities uh, with respect to the current ecosystems of, of clinical trials within, with, within the MPSs uh, and lysosomal diseases uh, in general. And it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's a very exciting time for therapeutic development, uh, particularly in the mucopolysaccharidoses, but it's also a very complex time. Um, the, the, uh, the environment is still very much a corporate environment, which, which um, I'd like to remind people, uh, the companies that are developing therapies uh, have a corporate infra infrastructure. Yes, they want to do what's best for patients, but at the end of the day, there's a bottom line. Um, uh, they're developing a therapy um, to uh, run their, 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 their corporation. Um, and so I'd like to highlight, I'd like to take a little bit of a step back from, from what you've heard this morning and highlight some of the complexities and some of the thought processes that you should probably go through with respect to trying to navigate uh, the complex clinical trials that, that are, that are uh, available now as well as the ones th that are going to be available um, in the future. And um, a, a one important aspect of decision making 
when when you're deciding of whether you should be entering a clinical trial or for you to 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 be able to critically think about the clinical trial that you're reading about it uh, is to realize that there are different phases of clinical trials and and you've heard a, uh, a little bit about that today uh, but it's important to understand when you're contemplating entering a clinical trial what is the phase of that trial because that very much may influence your decision with respect to whether yourself or your child um, uh, uh, is applicable to that trial or whether you feel um, uh, uh, your child may benefit from the trial. Phase one trials are designed primarily for safety studies. Uh, many also explore dose, okay? And so you should know right from the start that if a, that if a trial has been designated as a phase one trial, it's not being engineered for efficacy, meaning it's not being engineered to prove that the drug works or that the approach works. The trial's being engineered to allow the company to feel comfortable that their product is safe. Um, they will explore efficacy endpoints because of course we're dealing with rare disease so you'd like to generate as much information as possible from every patient that's exposed, but the trial's designed for safety. In non-rare diseases, uh, about 90% of trials fail at phase, at phase one. Uh, most small molecules don't make it past phase one because there, there's a safety signal. For rare diseases, um, uh, the success rate through phase one is much, much, much higher. The reason being is that, is that for rare disease, we tend to develop therapies having a far better understanding of the disease pathogenesis, and they tend to be much more targeted than other small molecule therapies. Phase two trials, uh, by definition, are the initial trials that begin to have efficacy. But these trials usually do not have an untreated arm. So they, are th uh, they tend to be trials that, again, companies are using um, uh, uh, as uh, a way once they've proven safety of initially uh, getting, uh, uh, getting some feedback, is there efficacy? They're not the definitive efficacy uh, trials, but, uh, but they are the initial uh, stage for a company to decide, um, uh, uh, are they going to seek enough funds to run, uh, uh, to run a, phase, a phase three trial? The phase three trials tend to be what we call the the, the, uh, the final stage efficacy trials. Um, there's usually an untreated placebo arm, but there can be also many more complex designs, as we've seen recently with the, uh, with the approval of, of uh, uh, at the MPS7 uh, um, enzyme replacement therapy, the trial design was a, w was a much more complex trial design that there was a placebo, but not really, an, there was an untreated time a, a, a masked untreated time for patients, and, and it was a novel approach, but there tends to be in phase three an observational period where, where, where an individual is not receiving the product, and then uh, uh, an observational um, um, phase after. Most rare diseases do not require going to a phase four trial, and mo most phase four uh, trials are really post-marketing um, uh, trials. In rare diseases, thank God, we actually know most of the critical answers of efficacy by the time a drug gets to phase three. So, so, so it's really important to understand initially what is the phase of the trial wh when you're trying to make your decisions. It's also important to realize that clinical trials are performed because the true answer is not clearly known, okay? And that's, that's really important. That's the reason why the trial is being done, is that the therapy, the approach, the, de the, the delivery of the molecule, the, the dose of the molecule is just not known, which is why the clinical trial happens. Uh, just because a clinical trial starts does not mean that that drug is going to be the drug that eventually gets licensed or is licensed um, uh, at all, as some of you uh, uh, parents ha have seen with respect to um, s uh, the MPS2 and, and MPS3 trials. So it's important to realize that, that, the, that biology and physiology is complex. It's difficult to predict positive as well as negative effects. And uh, for some of you that may have attended some of the scientific sessions, you can see that uh, mucopolysaccharidoses are not storage disorders. 
But the symptoms that children have are not related to progressive storage. The symptoms that children have are related to the complex alteration of cellular physiology that occurs when you bung up the metabolism of glycosaminoglycans. And so that is really critical to, to know, uh, is that we do not understand the pathogenesis of, of mucopolysaccharidoses. So when you're hearing uh, about a new drug, about a new product, about a new process, and it sounds too simple, you should be very skeptical. Uh, because these are not simple disorders. They're complicated disorders. It's also important to realize that uh, as, as a drug or, or an approach is being developed, there's a lot of preclinical studies that are done. And preclinical studies are extremely well controlled. Whether they, are, whether they use a cell line, whether they use mouse models like my group develops, um, whether they, they use non-human primates, they are all extremely well controlled and they're very biased. Uh, a company or, or an academic who is, who is exploring uh, a potential new a method of therapy um, knows how to engineer that cell line, knows how to design the experiments with a higher likelihood that they're going to look positive. Um, the, uh, so it, it, it's very, very important to realize that although preclinical studies may look very exciting, uh, they, are, they are extremely controlled and uh, may not actually be applicable so, uh, in, in such a straightforward manner um, when it comes uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, to, to true human studies w where there's variation. Mice strains are all congenic strains. They do not uh, reflect human variation. Uh, again, all of us who use mouse models are uh, uh, very specifically use congenic strains where we can predict outcomes. B uh, the biotechnology view um, uh, um, is also uh, tends to be very narrow. There's good reason for that. A biotechnology company has to focus. Um, they want a success. And of course for them, a success is a good outcome for a patient too. Uh, uh, and they know that. B but their view can be very narrow. And uh, I like the statement is uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Okay, so if you've developed a particular method to deliver a drug, then you're gonna convince yourself and convince everyone else that that is the best thing for that particular disorder. Well. That's important for the company uh, with respect to motivation of their scientists and motivation of their team, but it, it may not be the right thing um, with respect to a complex disorder where we don't understand um, uh, uh, necessarily what the magnitude of impact of, of, of intervention is going to be. So I think it's really important for families to be critical of that and realize that that, that focus is very important. A gene therapy company is convinced that gene therapy is the way to go. Uh, a company who has developed something to cross the blood-brain barrier is convinced that that is the best way to go. Maybe they're right, but maybe they're not. From a personal perspective, I, I think it's important for people to stand back and think a lot before they, they, they enter a clinical trial. And some of the thinking should be, what specifically do I want? Now, this can be very personal, meaning you, you want your disease impacted. You want particularly symptoms that you have impacted. You want natural history impacted. You have yourself a, a view of what you want from the clinical trial. That's really important for you to write down and for you to consider your motivation for entering a clinical trial and feel good about that because that will allow you to make decisions based on information that you're now going to get about that particular molecule. And you can then add a plus or minus. This is what I want. Do I think this is going to uh, uh, achieve what I want? It's also very uh, uh, acceptable to have an al altruistic approach to clinical trials. You wanna enter the clinical trial, not necessarily for your own personal gain, but you wanna be able to move this field forward. Um, Again, your decision making may be very different based on whether you're going into a trial based on, on altruistic reasons or whether uh, th these are personal reasons. As I mentioned before, it's important to know what phase the trial's at. One also uh, important consideration uh, is, is for you to consider the possible side effects and are the side effects reversible? 
Many small molecules that are, that are developed have side effects, but the side effects disappear once the drug is stopped. Uh, we're now entering an era uh, in the lysosomal disorders where some of the side effects of some of the therapies may not be reversible. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's very important to consider that. Examples of things that are not reversible, antibody formation. If you start producing antibodies to a foreign protein, we know now in medicine, it is damn difficult to get rid of those antibodies. Um, gene therapy products, if they're altering your genome, they're permanent. Um, a small molecule is different. Uh, so uh, w one needs to really consider the different aspects of, of uh, possible side effects. You also need to know what is the development plan or ask the companies, what is their development plan? Are they, uh, do they have support to go from phase one to phase two to phase three, or from phase one to a complex phase two, three study? Um, that's important for you to know, because if you're entering a trial in phase one and you're not convinced that this company actually has any capability of moving beyond phase one, you might, you might rethink your motives to entering that particular trial, particularly now that we have multiple trials for the same disorder going on right now. Um, it's also really important to realize that the consent form that you're provided by um, a principal investigator for a clinical trial is only one source of information. That consent form is very complex. It tends to be very legally written sometimes. Uh, but it's only one source of information, and you should always seek other sources of information from either other clinicians around the world uh, or, or from other, other uh, patients. You should, all, uh, you should all also demand that all of your questions should be answered at your level. If you're getting an answer to a question of side effects or long-term effects or efficacy, and it's not put in an understandable manner for you, you should be concerned. Um, because uh, 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 every clinical trial should be explained at the level of, of, of your particular understanding. But also, when it comes to rare disease, expect to hear things like, we don't know. Um, and in fact, if you hear that, it should make you feel good, because I think you're getting an honest answer. If, if, a, if a, a principal investigator or a biotechnology company you're talking to is beginning to answer your questions with, we're not sure, because that is, is uh, the, the, um, the realm of, of, of rare disease. It, it's also uh, important for you to hear, and I've run a number of clinical trials, and I know this is very difficult for parents and individuals to hear, uh, a statement like, there may be side effects or um, uh, effects from this approach that we cannot necessarily predict or explain. That is critical. There is not a drug that is developed, and particularly in this particular complex group of disorders, where we can necessarily predict every possible effect um, uh, 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 of those drugs. And so you should be hearing that from, your, from the principal investigator of a <coughs> clinical trial, that, that there may be side effects that we don't know about yet until that clinical trial runs. Um, and so with all of this, you're balancing a risk of benefit ratio. But I think if you have this paradigm in front of you, you can begin to have at least a context for you to try to make a decision of whether this is the, is the clinical trial that, uh, that you should enter. The other complexity of, uh, of, of, of decision-making is for you to, to ask the question, is the treatment directed towards the primary defect, meaning the enzyme deficiency? Um, there, there are many approaches now that are being developed that are not necessarily targeting to the primary defect. So I think that's, uh, that's very important consideration for yourselves. Also asking the question, will this reverse my symptoms or slow my progression? And, and what's, what's the evidence of that? Unfortunately, for most of these disorders, uh, I think we have to accept the fact that reversal of symptoms themselves is not likely to be a large component of therapeutics for lysosomal disorders. What's going to be um, more um, uh, obvious is, is slowing progression of disease. Now, we could be wrong as we, we begin to develop better therapies for joint disease, but I personally think that what we're going to see with the lysosomal disorders, uh, even with very effective therapies, um, is very little in the way of reversing symptoms. 
you may reverse biomarkers and you may reverse liver size and you may reverse spleen size, but, but they don't actually cause symptoms. Um, it, it, so if you're entering a trial based on the symptomatology that you have, um, uh, I think you need to realize that reversing of reversal of symptoms is far more difficult. It's also important for you to ask the question, particularly now in, in, the, in the environment that we have um, multiple clinical trials going on in disorders that we already have approved therapies, is uh, will the trial affect my ability to continue with my current treatment? Um, as well as with, will, the, will my involvement in a clinical trial affect my future response to the current treatment I'm on? And this, this, is, this is an issue that's, that some of the families are beginning to explore in the NPS1 and NPS2 trials. Again, the reason being is uh, they may be stable on their current form of therapy, but they still have progressive symptoms, which we know patients have. Uh, the addition of another therapeutic on top of that could potentially affect their response to the initial uh, therapy they're on. Um, but also asking yourself the question, particularly in the environment where there's multiple clinical trials going on and there's, there is current therapy available, should I or can I wait until we actually understand more about this particular drug and what effect it, ha it has? And, and this is a question a lot of MPS1 and MPS2 uh, uh, families are asking. If you're on algerazyme or elaprase, well, should you be entering a Trojan horse study? Should you be entering a different delivery study? Is it going to affect the way I'm responding to my therapy now? That seems to be pretty good. Um, uh, we don't know the answer to, uh, to a lot of those questions. Um, it's also important to ask the question, will participation in this trial affect my ability to, par to participate in other clinical trials in the future? And that's critical when there's multiple uh, possible therapies available for, for certain disorders. Um, and you may not be able to benefit from other drugs in the pipeline if you're involved in a clinical trial uh, at, at its early stage. Also, of course, asking the question is, eventually, will I be able to, to receive the correct dose if I happen to be on the lower dosing arm of a clinical trial? Those are questions that we don't know. I'm just going to wrap up with a, with a few uh, uh, other principles. Um, the immune system. The immune system is really complex. Uh, th that's a very important consideration. And, it, and it's, it's definitely a role that is played in the efficacy or plays a very important role in the efficacy of, of, of therapies for, for the lysosomal disorders. Um, the immune system reacts to foreign proteins. If you have a genetic disorder and you're receiving either enzyme replacement therapy or a gene-based uh, product, that is often considered a foreign protein to your immune system. Um, also, some proteins are being engineered. They're being fused to, to, um, to antibody uh, fragments, as, as you heard this morning. That now becomes a foreign protein. The immune system recognizes that as a foreign protein. Saying that antibodies have not been demonstrated to affect uh, efficacy doesn't mean they don't affect efficacy. Uh, clinical trials where we have shown uh, all patients develop antibody titers, well, we have no way of knowing whether those antibody titers are actually affecting efficacy because all the patients have antibodies. Um, so uh, knowing that antibodies are forming does not necessarily mean that, that they do not affect effic efficacy. I'm going to end with just gene therapy. We're all excited about gene therapy. Um, but it's a risk-benefit balance again. Uh, and with gene therapy, it's also important to realize the immune system's complex. Gene therapy vectors, once you're exposed to them, the vector itself you develop antibodies to. That may influence your ability to be exposed to that vector in the future should you happen to be in the low-dose clinical trial uh, arm, which is ultimately found to be not effective, you may not be able to receive the, the, the ultimate dose uh, later. Now that's a changing environment also. Other questions for gene therapy though is, well, does the gene therapy alter my genome? Um, and of course, that's what gene therapies are, uh, have the potential risk. Adeno-associated virus itself does not integrate 
um, uh, into the chromosome, as far as we know, to any great degree. Um, but the cargo uh, uh, can. Um, some of the gene editing clinical trials that are on uh, th that are going on right now, of course, you are editing your genome, um, and how uh, you have then have to ask the question: How specific is that gene editing? Although it's targeted to a particular gene, uh, and I won't mention the gene because I don't, I don't want to point out any particular company at this point. Um, but there are there are potential uh, targeting to other areas of the genome. Again, it's a risk it's a risk benefit ratio. Remember that malignant cells derive from single clones. So, uh, uh, but malignancy is usually not a single event, but there is always the potential when one is playing around with your genome of, of altering uh, gene expression. One also needs to ask the question when it comes to gene therapy trials is, does gene therapy alter my reproductive cells? That's a far more difficult question for people to answer at, the, at this point in time. When you're altering your genome, either by gene, gene uh, editing or uh, direct integration of a vector, if you're a woman, are you altering uh, your, your um, uh, premature uh, egg cells? If it's a man, are you altering your, your primordial sperm cells? Um, we don't know the answers to a, lot, to, uh, to a lot of those questions. Can the gene therapy re be reversed? Right now, gene therapy for lysosomal disorders is not engineering suicide systems where one can then stop the, the, uh, the gene uh, from, from, producing, from, from producing its product. So you have to ask the question, how long will the protein um, uh, pr production uh, persist? And if there is complications, what can be done about it? I think that's my last slide. Um, so I, I, I hope I haven't scared you. But I, but I hope I've given a, a, um, a bit of a context with respect to um, uh, the, the, the complex thinking and the critical thinking that one needs to do in order to um, uh, consider entering a clinical trial and weigh the risk-benefit ratios of clinical trials and the potential impact that they may have on you or your family. Thank you. Our next speaker is the lovely Amy Holland. I want to let you know that Amy is the mother of three children with um, MPS1, and she has been um, a member of the Board of Directors with the National MPS Society for over 20 years, and her family has, has experienced clinical trials, and she's going to speak about that and about the new frontier with optional therapies in front of their family. And no, this is not Steve. <laughs> So <clears throat> my husband, Steve, is usually asked to speak at these um, big symposium meetings, and I always say to him, what am I, chop liver? You know, he goes off to Paris and, and speaks and goes off to Austria and speaks, and chop liver stays home with the girls. So um, today is your lucky day because chop liver is here. And what I have recently learned is that Liver is a superfood, so watch out. <laughs> well, <clears throat> as Terry said, I'm Amy Holland. Um, I have a beautiful family. Uh, we live in Fort Worth, Texas. And my children were all three diagnosed in the course of a one-week period in 1994. Their ages were four, three, and 15 months of age when that happened. So, um, oh, sorry, I'm not used to advancing slides. Um, <clears throat> my mother-in-law, I think, was really angry with me, so she made these matching outfits for my little girls and I. I, I still, to this day, don't know what I did to her, but anyway. So this is what my children looked like when they were babies and newly diagnosed with MPS1. And my husband, because he's a CPA, he always says we hit one out of four, one out of four, one out of four, three times in a row. And he really likes to talk about the numbers of that occurring, but anyway. Um, when my children were diagnosed, of course, I think the scariest phrase that we heard back then was that there was no cure. We asked immediately about treatments and were told that there were bone marrow 
transplantations being done. And so we flew our family to the University of Minnesota and spoke with Dr. Bill Crivet then about the, about the possibility of maybe our children having a bone marrow transplant. So all three children were placed on the, the national donor list, but there were no potential matches and no donors to be found for them. And so um, we had, <clears throat> I think pr prior to that, we had come to a meeting just like this and we were just like you. We were trying to learn everything we can, we could about MPS and we met a young researcher named Dr. Amo Kakis. And Dr. Kakis sat with us at the, at the back of a meeting in a foyer. He spoke to us for over four hours while me and Steve pelted him with every question we could think of. He told us he was working on a potential therapy for MPS1, but it was not ready yet and they were working diligently in their lab. And so what I did was I sent a, um, a picture of my children. I had it enlarged and sent it to him and gave him instructions to, to put it up in his lab where all the lab workers could see it. And I wrote in very big letters, think about us every day. So <clears throat> just a few, maybe a few years after learning that my children did not have donors for bone marrow transplantation, we got a call from Dr. Kakis saying, I've just taken your children's picture down off my wall. I turned it over, your phone number's on the back, and I'm reaching out to you because we're, we're looking for trial participants at this time. So <clears throat> my son Spencer was patient number four in the world treated um, with enzyme replacement therapy. And that clinical trial had 10 patients. At the time, um, they were only allowing one child per family, and only my two older children were fit the age qualifications. My husband and I could not have decided who should be submitted, and so we submitted both and trusted the doctors to make the best choice, which they did because Spencer was a really compliant patient. So um, my children also participated, Maddie and Lainey participated in the phase three clinical trial of enzyme replacement therapy, but it, it was a wait for us. We waited almost three years for that clinical trial to open back up into a phase three. And so as a family looking for clinical trials for your children, you wanna be very proactive and very involved in the clinical trial as an entire family. And I was in my kitchen one day and I had a little boy who, who went from being pushed in a stroller to the park to a little boy who skipped to the park every single day within four weeks of starting ERT. And my girls were draggy and getting sick all the time and not feeling well. And I was watching the clock in my kitchen just tick, tick, tick one day while we were waiting for this phase three part to open up. And I grabbed my kitchen phone and started calling every media outlet I knew of. So that was on a Tuesday. Thursday night, Dan Rather and the Dan Rather C and the CBS Evening News crew we're at our house. I don't know, I must have been a good talker. So anyway, um, they came and um, did a story on our family and our wait for the opening of the phase three part of this clinical trial. Um, we were also featured on 2020 and the Oprah Winfrey show came. So parents, you have to be very, very proactive and don't just sit back and let all trial decisions be made by others. <laughs> So um, <clears throat> anyway, my daughter, Lainey, participated in a clinical trial for enzyme replacement therapy given intrathecally to see if it would help with her spinal cord compression. And then my daughters, Maddie and Lainey, are still to this day participating in an intrathecal ERT clinical trial. They've been doing that now for about seven or eight years. Okay, so the trial issues we faced was that my husband and I had to make these huge decisions for minors. And that can be, that can trip up a lot of families. Like I'm making these big decisions for my children. Um, 
but the reasons to participate, of course, are to, um, you want to help your child, but there's a greater good, and you want to help all children with MPS. So we had to really make, we had to really talk to our children and, and help them to understand why we wanted them to do this. So back then, there was no Dora the Explorer, but, you know, John Smith was part of the Pocahontas story. So we talked to Spencer and Maddie about being explorers and that explorers were necessary in the world. Um, we talked to our entire family. Our entire family had many powwows before deciding to participate in a clinical trial because it affects every single member of your family, whether they're affected or not. Those in your extended family will also be very affected by trial participation because of the support they have to give. So another issue we faced was that we lived in Texas. Our clinical, the phase one clinical trial for ERT was in California, which meant a lot of flying back and forth. When the phase three clinical trial opened up for the girls, we were flying to both coasts. We would fly the girls to North Carolina, to Dr. Munzer, and then we would fly Spencer back to UCLA in California. In some weeks, we were three days California, four days North Carolina, and we never knew where we were when we woke up. But um, there are also a lot of tests that your kids have to go through. And um, it was really hard back then to try to get trial participation from families, just like Dr. Clark was saying. Um, not every family feels comfortable stepping up in these roles. So I remember that Steve and I called every friend we had in the MPS One world to get this first clinical trial up and off the ground. And one of my friends said to me when I called her, she said, well, my daughter doesn't want to do it. and We should listen to her. And I said, your daughter is seven years old. You know, you cannot let her make these decisions about her future. You are responsible for her. And she said, well, she just, she just said no. And I said, well, ask her what it would take for her to participate. And so her daughter came back and said, it would take a corgi. And so I told the mom and dad, go get yourself a corgi. So the little girl participated in the first clinical trial. But sometimes, you know, we have to advocate for ourselves and advocate for um, all the families with MPS to, to push the ball forward. And this was so important. This clinical trial was just very important to everybody. So um, for our children, we tried to make the clinical trial fun. I remember when Spencer participated in Los Angeles, I bought a book called In and Out of Los Angeles with the Family or In and Around. We ticked off boxes and did every county fair. We went to every um, child-friendly pizza place. We just, we tried to make it a blast. And my kids have great memories of that time in their lives. So um, the negatives about clinical trial participation is that there's this increased focus on your child's health care, which is fine for my husband and I. We, we welcomed it, but my children were not so enthused um, to have people always talking about the things that are wrong with you can be daunting to a child trying to grow up in a normal, happy childhood. So we had to try to make those visits fun as well. There's also a great disruption to your family, to your family schedule, your work schedule, kids going in and out of school, and you have to make that work by calling in all of your friends and the people in your community who would probably do anything that you asked. So you just have to involve everybody you can. There's also the financial demands that can sometimes happen in clinical trial participation because not everything will be covered. So trying to um, find ways to to meet the financial burdens for families. The big things are covered, I will tell you. Some of the small managerial aspects were not covered and we became fundraisers for our family just so that we could safely participate in this trial, in these trials. The positives um, is that we felt for the first time like we had just a smidgen of control over what was happening to all of our children. Um, sometimes you have to feel like you are 
you are being proactive and you are doing everything you can to help your child fight. So that was a big, a big plus for us. Um, you do have access to the best specialist in the world in your child's disease. So um, this was just something that, that we were really looking forward to, to having relationships with these doctors. And then you, t you have to think about the potential benefits to your child, and not just your child, but every child you have met with MPS1. And MPS, in general, you want this to trickle down to every single child you meet. So um, the concerns, of course, Dr. Clark just talked about the fact that now, unlike my family, there are many, many choices open to some families looking for clinical trials. And what you have to do is filter through all of the information so that you can make the best decision for your family and your child. So um, Dr. Harmetz is in the audience and we have spent pro literally probably five years of his life asking him questions. So <clears throat> um, we, we ask every question and we don't stop until we feel comfortable with the information that we're hearing. Um, you have to be very, very comfortable with the team that you choose, with the method that they're choosing. You have to fully understand the risk and benefits. And um, when you move forward knowing your child is participating in a clinical trial, you want, you want to fully engage yourself in that with no questions and with no regrets. So... Um, you just have to get comfortable. So, um, oh wait, I, I went backwards instead of forward, sorry. So, right now there are some um, current trial concerns. One of those is that there are some non-sharing of information. Um, I guess some, some companies are not willing to let families share information through social media because they're trying to contain information about the trial. This poses um, a little bit of a problem to families who need their social media support. They need every piece of support they can get. So that's just something to discuss with these companies if you're considering a trial. Um, the transition from minors to adulthood, we had children who were, um, seven and eight years old when they started a clinical trial. And now my children are adults and they're, they're having to make these decisions for themselves while my husband and I kind of take a little bit of a back seat. So that can be um, a, little, a little difficult for us as parents, but um, it's just something that you have to think about. And um, we think about the fact that some of our children need these treatments desperately and they're very young. So we know that the outcome would be even better. The younger we can get these kids into clinical trials, the better the outcome will be for everybody. But there are stipulations and it's difficult to get young children into clinical trials. So as parents, we need to do the best job we can advocating for this. We need clinical trials open for every age group we need different studies going on for younger children as well as older children, and we merge all the information together instead of making one age group sit, sit out and wait. So um, in the end, you know, what we always say as a family is no pain, no gain, no risk, no reward. And as parents, um, my husband and I have this analogy where MPS is a battlefield. And we, everyone in this room, we are all the soldiers on that battlefield. Um, we weren't asked to be a part of this battle. We were drafted. And some of us have come kicking and screaming and crying all the way. But now that we're here, um, you know, there are many positions on a battlefield. There are positions in the back. There are positions in the front. And while the um, positions in the back of the battlefield are very important, the supply lines and the strategic planning, if nobody ever stepped forward, the battles would never, ever be won. So um, 
we sometimes as parents, we have to take that step forward because if we don't, then we don't move science forward. And if my son Spencer had not participated in the very first clinical trial, which was really scary back then, if he had never stepped up, then ERT would not be available for all children, the, all of the children that it is today. So we have heroes to thank for that. And <clears throat> we just, we have to know that some people are going to have to go to the front so that we can win this war. Someday we'll be in this room together and it'll be a family reunion. We won't be sitting here talking about how to cure our children. We're gonna sit, be sitting here catching up with everybody because the battle will have been won and the cure will have been found. So thank you very much for, for all of your <laughs> active listening. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. I know we're running a, a little bit behind to our session today, but our next speaker is Stacy Hewson. Stacy's with the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and is a genetic counselor at the hospital, working in the Division of Clinical and Metabolic Genetics for the last 17 years. She received her Master of Science degree in genetic counseling from McGill University in 1998 and a Master of Science degree in molecular biology in 1998 from the American Board of Genetic Counseling. She is actively involved. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that is just lovely, isn't it? And Kendra's a dear friend of mine, and I did that to her. I know. I, kn I know. Isn't that, isn't that terrible? And I feel terrible. I'm sorry, Kendra. I know. I know. Let's, let's start again. We'll pretend like that just didn't happen. Well, I'm going, I want to 